As a soldier, he rocks. As a king, he rules. Fanara, as pure as virgin snow. We've met. She's not that pure. But his choice of a bride leaves something to be desired. Call the Conqueror. If you ask me what are some of my favorite films, you'd likely expect some movies such as Braveheart, Pirates of the Caribbean, or The Dark Knight. But you likely wouldn't expect this one. I give you your new king! Long live Cole! Long live Today, we're going to be talking about the fantasy action film, Cole the Conqueror. Now just a quick summary of the plot so you know what it's all about. Cole is a warrior from Atlantis. Soon, he finds himself named King after the previous king suffers a mortal wound from Cole himself. Many people want the crown, but it had been given to Cole in the end. During his initial stint, Cole makes many enemies since taking the throne and in an attempt to overthrow him. His enemies resurrect an ancient sorceress named Akivasha played by Tia Carrera, a severely underrated actress. Now, Akivasha was at one time the witch queen of a lost city called Acheron. She uses her power to trick Cole into marrying her, and then she betrays him. And in order to save his kingdom, Cole has to rise from the dead, figuratively, and find the mythical breath of Valka, which he did not believe existed initially. He does this with the help of a tarot card reading slave girl named Zaretta and her brother, the priest Escalante, played by Native American actor Lightfoot. The Topaz throne she will bring back, ancient Acheron, and open the gates of hell. This film is one of my favorites because it has great pacing, pretty decent fight scenes for the 90s, with the lead Kevin Sorbo doing a pretty good job on screen for his debut. Sorbo initially became known to audiences through his work on television playing the legendary hero Hercules on the show Hercules The Legendary Journeys. Now in addition to Kevin, the supporting cast is terrific I think. Tia Carrera had been a massive crush of mine ever since her role as Cassandra in Wayne's World. And I thought she did really well in this film as an evil woman attempting to steal Cole's kingdom. But I'll touch on her a little bit more in the video. Cole the Conqueror, which is what we're talking about today. It's an adaptation of author Robert E. Howard's Conan novel, The Hour of the Dragon, penned by screenwriter Charles Edward Pogue, and it was originally planned to be the third Conan movie, but Arnold Schwarzenegger passed on it, and it was rewritten for the Cole character that was created by Robert E. Howard. I think Kevin did a great job playing Cole the Conqueror, but his supporting cast was fantastic, even though they're not as well known to the home audiences. There are several actors whom I grew up with in the 90s, including the Native American Lightfoot, who had major roles in some of my favorite films as a kid, including his role as Nightwolf in Mortal Kombat Annihilation, I've seen better. Don't sweat it. I've seen worse, too. And most famously, his role as Little Bear in the classic hit Indian in the Cupboard. Karina Lombard also made her mark prior to this film, primarily in her role as Isabel II in the famous Legends of the Fall, co-starring Brad Pitt. Aside from Carrera, the biggest villain in this film is that of General Taligaro, played by Thomas Ian Griffith. Sharp-eyed viewers probably notice that this is the actor who played the bad guy Terry Silver in the Karate Kid films. We have an agenda here, Daniel. It's really very simple. You guys are crazy. Either you fight one fight on one day, or you fight every day for the rest sick. of your life. What's it gonna be, Danny boy? Gonna... Now, I really like Griffith's cocky attitude as a villain, even if I think this fantasy setting isn't exactly the best for his style. Thankfully for all you Karate Kid fans, it appears we may see Terry Silver once again in the Karate Kid series known as Cobra Kai next season when it comes out. So that'll be fun to look forward to. It would be an absolute crime if I didn't mention one of my favorite side actors of all time, which is Harvey Firestein. This is an actor you've probably seen or heard before in films, but I doubt many young people at this point really know his name. Harvey plays the character of Juba, an old pirate friend of Cole's. That was a joke, come on. The role is perfect for me because of my beautiful sense of style and my lovely hair. My lovely hair, which I think they got off a Croatian dog certainly got to fleas with it. He brings an added element of humor and whimsy to the plot while he's around that I think no one else in the cast is really capable of. You'll feel better if you have something to eat. You like fish eye? No fish eye. Okay, bring on the meat. Forget the hors d'oeuvres. Firestein's iconic voice has been present in so many good projects such as Mulan, 
Mrs. Doubtfire. You mean like uh, Shelley Winters older or Shirley McLean older? What's the difference? Some scotch tape and red hair dye. What about Joan Collins? Oh, I don't think I have the strength. All right. And the eternally underrated Death to Smoochie. But I'm thrilled to see him stretching his ability in this medieval epic type fantasy, which he never normally did in his career. And finally, I want to talk about Tia Carrera a little bit more. This isn't the first film Tia plays as a leading lady, as she had been the prominent love interest in Wayne's World 1 and 2, which had huge success. But this was certainly a big step for Tia, as she attempted to play the epitome of evil, which couldn't have come easy for such a genuinely nice person in real life. The reason why I responded to this material was because it's so much fun exploring that darker side of, of uh, human nature and um, cutting loose. <laughs> We're all so doggone polite all the time. It's nice to cut loose and get truly evil. I think Tia's performance was quite good in her orange-clad gear, attempting to make a kingdom fall and rise again with just a simple kiss. Fortunately for Tia, despite this film's kind of lackluster performance, she maintained steady work in Hollywood for the next two decades, including a major role as Nani in the famous Disney film Lilo and Stitch. You were supposed to wait there! Lilo! In the making of the film, there were certainly bumps along the way. It's been said that Kevin Sorbo had grueling workouts in preparation for Cole, and his filming schedule for the movie may have led to life-threatening illness that landed him in the hospital just days after the premiere. Although, this was never confirmed, but it was a prevalent rumor back in the day. And if that wasn't enough for Sorbo, rumor is that he was stung by a sea urchin and injured his foot badly while filming. Talk about suffering for your art, Kevin. Talk about suffering for your art. Sadly, the film debuted at number 9 in the US, with only over 3 million in its opening weekend. It went on to gross just 6.1 million dollars in the United States. Now in fairness to the film, the timing of the theatrical premiere was not the best either, for a couple of reasons. The first one being it was the weekend of Labor Day, where Americans typically head to beaches or do anything outdoors, especially in 1997, where watching TV or movies outside wasn't as easy as today. As for the second reason, it was the same weekend that Princess Diana was killed, and many folks stayed home to watch the TV coverage of that tragedy. Again, it's not as easy as pulling up your phone. You had to sit by the TV and watch the evening news if you wanted to learn about Princess Di. Basically, what I'm saying is no one wanted to be in a movie theater that weekend, and it likely cost some of these talented actors some projects they would have obtained after Cole the Conqueror. Kevin Sorbo probably being the biggest victim as leading man, I'm sure. Kevin himself has said more than once that the film would have been better had they stuck to the original script, which would have produced an R-rated film. However, the producers wanted to draw on the audience that was watching Kevin as Hercules on TV, which was mainly young people, so the film ended up being rated PG-13. Now I myself am not sure that Kevin would have been right about its financial success, as that seemed doomed to fail based on the film's release date as we spoke about. But its standing throughout the years could have proven Sorbo right with a darker rating possibly. However, I like the light and fun moments in the film that were similar to what we got with Hercules on television. Delante. What are you doing? I can't take a man's life. Now you tell me. And that likely would have been written out had the film been an R-rated one. So I can't say I'm really complaining about what the finished product was. A few notes about the making of the film. It was shot in various cities in Slovakia and Croatia thus creating the ancient atmosphere of Cole's time. However, actors did note that Croatia is not exactly the most fun place in the world to film. I said, where are you filming this? He said, sunny Croatia. I said, is the weather really nice? Oh, beautiful, beautiful. It's summer there now. The sun is shining, the birds are singing. But it's a lovely place. I'm sure I'll come back again soon. In spite of some occasionally iffy effects, and the sword fighting being a bit simple by today's standards, this is actually a terrific entertainment in an action film, I think, being as well-paced as you can ask for. Now, we sitting here in 2021 are going to compare it to the Lord of the Rings trilogy or another epic such as Game of Thrones, and frankly, it pales in comparison. But for the times, it really wasn't that bad. That's how a barbarian fights! In any effect, it was good for Kevin Sorbo's first attempt at a lead role in a major motion picture. It just didn't work out. He looked the part, he said the basic hero lines he needed to. If you don't like my kingship, come take the throne. He played off characters like Juba really well as a serious guy. 
Oh, Carl, you know I hate the smell of fish. I insist. And he had a testosterone-driven character I could get behind as a little boy in the 90s. But sadly for Kevin, I didn't see him in another film until he graced our screens with a supporting role where he played a, let's say, different kind of warrior. In closing, even though many people don't remember this film, I take every chance I get to watch it if it's ever on TV, or if it's just a lazy Saturday afternoon, I'll pull out the old external hard drive and load up the film while I'm editing another video, or maybe if I'm playing a game. It's just refreshing and nice to see a sword and sorcery fantasy with relative unknowns on the big screen these days. And just a reminder how fun some of these movies were before it became all about CGI and how could we spin off from this major hit that's from a book over and over and over again. Mind you, I'm aware that Call the Conqueror is spun off from a book, but it's a, it's a different world now. But that's gonna do it for this rendition of what I'm calling Forgotten Fantasies. As I go through old films and TV shows of the past that I loved, that really we should talk about a little bit more and give more credit to. If you wanna see more videos on my channel, all you have to do is hit the subscribe button so that you can get all those uploaded to the front page of YouTube as soon as I post them. And of course, if you would give this video a thumbs up, I would really appreciate that as it will help my channel greatly. Otherwise, hope you have an amazing day, everybody. You take care. Goodbye.